other parameters that you should follow. What happened to the PIP after you make a change on the, on the PIP? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ruben. Thank you, Dr. Yeser. Uh, if you have more questions? Dr. Omaima? Dr. Omaima, you have a tale of two cities, the fragmented hernia over decades. Um, it's 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 oh, uh, well, thank you very much. It was supposed to be actually the first one, so it can be sort of introduction, but it's okay. It will be very short, very quick, okay? Is that fine? So, thank you very much. هو الحقيقة علاقتي بالدافراجماتيك هيرنيا جست أول كيس أنا يعني تعرضت ليها كانت سنة 1992 شتاء 1992 بالضبط من 30 سنة بيشنت اتولد أنا كنت في محضن النساء ونايت شيفت و I still remember the baby's face I still remember where the baby was where where is the incubator um, he was a term baby, um, um, a very beautiful baby, like all, all the newborn babies we have. Um, signs of respiratory distress, term baby. So initially we used to put use head box, and the baby was really saturating very well. And then I just started to examine, and he seemed to me like barrel chest, ciscophoid abdomen, but no meconium at all, it was clean. Um, and then I've done the x-ray and the x-ray showed congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So I've never seen any diaphragmatic hernia before, but from the clinical findings, bowel in the chest, this is a diaphragmatic hernia. And also before the x-ray, the, the auscultation was mainly the heart sounds heard on the right side. It was uh, at night. I called Dr. Hisham Awad at one o'clock in the morning. I told him I was so excited. I have a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. He said, Umayma called the pediatric surgeon immediately. Okay, so at that time, in 1992, it was a surgical emergency. So Dr. Ahmed Medhat, he came here uh, in the obstetric center and we've done the surgery, it was a successful surgery. It was done at three o'clock. I was with the anesthetist. I intubated the baby before. So anyhow, uh, we brought this baby. It was very stable after the surgery. This was in 1992. And um, uh, managed the ventilation. And the plan is to keep the baby paralyzed with pancronium and ventilate it for a week or so. And then we will assess. When, um, so I felt like this baby belongs to me. I want this baby really like the case to survive. And I stayed for 48 hours. When we come overnight. Kunt banam gambel bafresh haga wa anam gambel haddana lenu. At that time, we didn't have anything except the pulse oximeter. We didn't have the full monitor. Okay, lenu. If the alarm will 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 buzz, احتمال the nurse will not hear because you know one nurse out of five or six patients. After 48 hours, I had to go home. I handed over and I went home. يعني sort of قلبي كان رجعت بعد حوالي ساعتين ثلاثة at midnight and then I found the baby passed away. So what I was doing, I was like a guard, a guardian for the tube for the ATT. I was keen to make the endotracheal tube not to come out, not to dislodge because of the paralysis and secretions and the tape that may come off. However, when I handed over, and this has happened, I came to my colleague and I was so angry and so devastated and I said, probably you are the person who is accountable that this baby has died. Just over years, when I start to gain more and more experience, experience I realized one thing. It doesn't matter. It's not me that I've been a hero. I was nothing, okay? And my colleague, it was, he wasn't accountable for what has happened. This baby didn't die because my colleague didn't, you know, like look after him or stay beside to be a guardian for the endotracheal tube. It's not because of any one fault. It's just because of a system fault. And this is the thing that I learned over a year. It doesn't matter if I have a doctorate degree in a congenital diaphragmatic hernia management. It doesn't matter. This all science is great, but what we need to do during the morning round, during the care from day to day, is to put system. The system we follow 
you know, you don't need to educate everybody with every single scientific detail. We need to create the system. Today, you are going to do this and this. In every unit in the UK, and uh, must be the same in Canada, we do a, an audit for the accidental extubation. This is what I learned. The baby has died because of accidental extubation. I try to minimize, in every unit I go, we try to minimize, not me, it's a system. This is what we do. We, we, when we observe that the, the number of accidental extubation, we try to analyze why this has happened. And then we try to do everything to prevent that from happening. So this baby sadly passed away, but the problem wasn't the way we manage and be, or because of the lack of knowledge or because of the lack of the ventilator. At that time, we had the sick wrist IMV, which is the, the normal, the CMV. There was no other sign, you know, like synchronized or fancy ventilators. But unfortunately, the baby has passed away simply because the baby was extubated. This baby was one of those who should survive. And there are plenty, 70 of the cases or 60% of the cases of diaphragmatic hernia should not die because they are mostly belonging to this category. Sorry for the story, but I think it was so important to address this because if I, if I have this pain inside me over 30 years because this baby died and he didn't deserve to die. And I think if there is anything I do for him, yani aktar min al dua no yani to just deliver this message and hopefully it will prevent other babies from passing away. I'm not going to go the stories in details, it just I will go, so in 1992 we did immediate surgery, we did pancuronium for paralysis and we used um, conventional ventilator. Let's go back when we, you know, in 1990, in 1980, so we say pulmonary hypertension, actually this, they used Swangan's pressure, um, catheter to measure the pulmonary pressure and this is when they realized that they have increased in um, pulmonary hypertension. So the only way to treat pulmonary hypertension in that era is um, we use ventilator, which was Siemens 900C, is a conventional ventilator that's now like our secret in the museum, and to use pancuronium and keeping the baby paralyzed and try to induce sort of alkalinization by the hyperventilation and by chemical sodium bicarb and TAM. You know the TAM, which is like alkalotic agent to make the pH alkaline. So if you, if you see here with this management, the overall survival was 45%. And the isolated CDH survival, isolated those cases without any associated abnormality was 73%. So this is 80 to 84. Yeah, then from 80 to 84, there was a brilliant um, surgeon who came, surgical, surgeon, surgical trainee, who came to the pediatric surgery to work in Boston with Jay Wilson. Jay Wilson is one of those people who led the improvement in the management of congenital diaphragmatic hernia to a great deal. So this pediatric, this surgeon, he came just finished his rotation in the cardiac cardiothoracic, and he observed that those babies are died. And then he said, why not to use what we use for adults in heart, open heart um, surges, the heart lung machines. And this was the basis for starting the era of ECMO. So what happened when ECMO has been established? The overall survival became 42% and the isolated CDH cases, the mortality um, dec actually decreased, it dropped. The survival is only 61%. So ECMO didn't do much improvement in that era. So in 19, between 1987 and 1990, um, what has happened? So in the old days, congenital diaphragmatic hernia was regarded as immediate surgical emergency. So in Boston, they started to ask, oh, Toronto, they are not operating on babies immediately. So they consider that this is, this is the idea or the concept that this is a physiological emergency and not surgical emergency. So with the Siemens 900s, with the pancuronium, with the TAM, with the ECMO, and with surgical delay, this was the survival, 44% and 57% in the isolated case. And simply because of the, probably, the... Um, 
the um, ECMO complication. So they were unhappy with this. They came, they brought all the previous charts and the PM reports and they start to analyze what was the cause of death. Other than complications of associated anomalies and cardiac anomalies, actually the main issue was barotrauma. Barotrauma has led to a lot of problems. Barotrauma was probably responsible for mortality in more than 50% of cases. And this is again one of the historic papers uh, with uh, uh, when the era of gentle ventilation innovation has started. So a tale of two cities, the two cities are Boston and Toronto. And during that time in 1990, this was the first exchange of data that has happened between two big centers. They give each other their data and the other side analyze their, 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 their cases, and they, they publish this, um, as I said, the historic um, uh, experience from both centers. And since then, and I, I choose the term or the phrase that, you know, said by Jay Wilson, the, the great pediatric surgeon, that we have to put our, our bias aside and we have to put also our egos and start to work together, collaborate together, learn from each other, and from that perspective, they, they started to, this is when they started the CDH International Study Group, which was something that I wish that Egypt to join. So 65 countries are working together to improve or to collaborate to improve the survival. So the overall survival until now is about 75, 70 to 75%. And people everywhere are struggling to try to minimize this 30%. The ECMO, probably now, before it was used for everybody, but now it's used only for, for 25, 30%. So after the 1990, now we have a bit fancier ventilators, and we started to avoid paralysis, and we start to encourage spontaneous breathing, and we start to allow permissive vent hypercarbia, so CO2 of 60 and pH of 7 to 5, as, as, as we say. So uh, also the new treatment for pulmonary hypertension, um, like and ventilation to get volume guarantee, please start to use volume guarantee. It's much easier, it's more physiological, and you just need to get used to it, and the nurses need to get used to it. So volume three to five, uh, for, as uh, um, Robin said, inhaled nitric oxide and the other medications. So the principle of management in 2016 didn't change much. It's mainly to try to avoid barotrauma. But please, we need also to be not to deviate to the other extreme and cause atelectic trauma. So not to be too gentle and not to be too aggressive. So where are we now? What is the survival? We need to collect data. We need to aim for something. I'm not aiming for 70%. Our target has to be smart, to be specific, and to be achievable. So if I aim for 70%, this is, this is not attainable probably with our circumstances, with our what we have. We need to aim for a reasonable outcome. You can start, if, you're, if your outcome, if your mortality is 80%, just work on decreasing this by 10% every year. And then you try to minimize, try to improve. It has to be a collaboration between all the country, between every centers, because in the university we have a lot of antenatally diagnosed cases, so we have to work on that. Um, learn from each other and the whole world now is open if you ask um, anyone in any country you will get an answer what we need to do further that's all thank you very much Uh, great thanks to Professor Obaima, Professor Yasser, Professor Ruben and now we end to the end of this session uh,